Please welcome George Trombolopoulos, Maysoon Zayed, and Keegan Michael Key. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Lovely to be with you all. Lovely to be here. I, I would not be here if it wasn't for that last woman there, Elisa Pugliese, who is uh, an amazing filmmaker and also just happens to be my fiance. Um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm so happy to, so wait, to be here. Wait, is Detroit Pictures code for something then? It's not actually a production company? No, it really is, it really is, it is. <laughs> we yeah. are, uh, we're talking about confronting stereotypes um, and you both do it uh, quite a lot in your work and, and we should get right to it right now. I mean, you've overcome the disability of being from New Jersey. I'm actually not the one who is disabled. You're... It's uh, Keegan who's disabled. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm the one who does angry Obama. He's the one with the disability. But we're all equal here. Talk about approaching the idea of a confronting a stereotype. Um, I, like I said, I mean, I'm just your generic white girl, so I don't really have those issues. Um, my joke on stage is I could win the oppression Olympics because I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm disabled, and I live in Donald Trump's America, so if you don't fucking feel better about yourself, you should. I don't think I'm allowed to curse. Sorry, I didn't curse. I won't do it again. Yeah. But comedy is the place to do it. You know, I dreamt of becoming an actress like most Muslim girls in America. I wanted to be on General Hospital. And, <laughs> and I just, I didn't see people who looked like me on TV and where I saw them was in stand-up comedy, especially Richard Pryor, the original Shaking comic. And, and that's why I did it. That's why you did it. Yeah. And for you? Um, you know, she just made me laugh so hard. What was the question? <laughs> just a, a, confronting stereotypes in comedy, and you know, she said this is the place to do it. Yes, it is the place to do it because I, I, I think, um, as we had mentioned backstage, sometimes it's when someone's making a dramatic satire, it's difficult to figure out what's happening sometimes. So I think the the domain of satire and the domain of trying to push social issues is in comedy, is very often in comedy. And and uh, you know, it's funny we probably we have a lot of the same heroes. I think Richard Pryor is a person who I learned a lot about, about society by him telling very particular and singular stories. And then you go, oh, that's his experience it must be shared by other people because the people wouldn't be laughing in the audience even though the story is so specific. Um, the funny thing is the more specific you become, the more general you become. Yep. So what, he, is, what is the reality, of the difference between using comedy and tackling stereotypes, confronting them as opposed to perpetuating them? And is there a distinction in your mind as a comic? <laughs> it, you know, it's hard. You, 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 you have to do the stereotype. You, you, you have to start there. Um, and you can kind of use like almost a social judo, for lack of a better word. You want to get everybody's expectation up. So, uh, for example, you know, Jordan and I were doing a sketch one time where um, I'm standing outside on a corner and I'm using an extremely, a, a very decidedly urban dialect while I'm talking, or, or, or I'm, I'm, I have no dialect and I'm talking to my wife on the phone about theater tickets and how the other parking spaces, maybe we should get there 20 minutes early, we should do all of this. And Jordan walks out of the, uh, walks out of the um, uh, convenience store and he's dressed a little bit kind of thuggish and he's like, yeah, no, he's on the phone, we're both on the phone. He's like, yeah, man, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about to cross the street right now. No, I'm gonna see you in a minute, man. Don't even worry about it. And then as soon as he starts doing it, I code switch, and I start going, yeah, no, I'm, I'm gonna pick your ass up at 6.30. Don't even worry about it. Nah, nah. And then he, so we're, we're kind of bantering back and forth, and we give each other the look, or what I like to call the Negro nod, like, so, you know, when you say, men say hello. And then as Jordan leaves the scene, he goes, oh my God, Christian, I almost just got mugged right now. <laughs> you need the stereotype to subvert the stereotype. So it's crucial, we, we, we need it. I mean, we need it to happen. But so, so I think is you have to tackle it. You have to zig into it so you can zag. Um, but, uh, but, but I think that's what, we, that's what we should do. And for me, I, I battled the stereotype, but not really on purpose. It's because I'm not the stereotype. So I started doing stand-up comedy right before 9-11. And when I became like 
a known comic. I was a Muslim chick doing comedy post 9-11. And I wasn't going out there being like, we're not terrorists. I was going out there doing tampon jokes. Because again, I thought that I was Richard Pryor. So I was like throwing around the N word like it was a job. Had to learn about not doing that, which I did learn. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I wasn't feeding into any of the stereotypes. So like the disability stereotype is you can't love us because we're disabled, heal me or kill me. And when I go out on stage, I'm not going out there being like, I can't get a date. I'm going out there being like, Arab girls don't date, don't tell my dad. You know what I mean? So I just wasn't the stereotype. So it wasn't that I was trying to battle them. I was authentically telling my own story that really took what people thought about Muslim women and shook it because I shake all the time. <laughs> it's what I do. For those of you who don't know, I'm not drunk. I have cerebral palsy. <laughs> so I shake it like Taylor Swift. She wants to, mine is involuntary. It's all about privilege. It's really all about privilege. Jesus Christ, she's great. Oh, super I'm from where Jesus Christ is from. What's that? I'm from. You're from where Jesus Christ yeah, is I from. Am. That's right. Jersey. So did Jersey. Did <laughs> <laughs> Wait, does that now? You you've done comedy in places in the world where where comedy doesn't really take yeah. place in terms of stand up. You did stand up in Jordan, Palestine as well. Done it here. What, what's the difference in, in tackling these sorts of conversations between the places? Well, there's a couple of things that are different. One was that when I started doing um, stand-up comedy in the Middle East, I didn't know that they didn't have the genre. So people are like, you have money, where'd you get it? And I'm like, I tell jokes. And they were like, do it. And so I went on stage and did it, and I didn't realize that I was one of the first people to ever do it. So what's cool is the Middle East doesn't have the negative stereotype that women aren't funny because I was the first person they saw. So when the men came out, they were like, ha, they're trying to be like me soon. Like, yeah. Um, when I do, <laughs> do stand-up comedy in the Middle East, I do it in Arabic. And Arabic is just a more like flowery, fluid language. It's just more fun. It's almost like Jersey, but it's a little bit more fun. But when, <laughs> when I'm doing stuff here, I have to explain everything. I have to say what a checkpoint is. I have to explain why my mom throws slippers at me and it's not abuse. I don't have STDs and I'm grateful. Um, and here, like there, I think the biggest thing is that they've never seen a functional disabled person. Mm. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm walking out there while limping quickly out there and just trying to get people to realize that like disability is not a death sentence, that if you have a child with a disability, you can, you know, have hope and dreams and push them forward. Whereas in the States, when I first started out, I really was just like a pop culture comic. Now I feel like doing comedy in the States is a fight for our lives. Because I really do. Yeah, no, I mean, I get threats all the time because I'm a public Muslim figure. And, you know, it's so cool. The President of the United States actually incites violence against me directly. And I think that's such a huge privilege. And, um, <laughs> And so now I'm fighting for my life. I'm, I'm going out there being like, we are American. We do deserve to live here. And the kind of the whole thing about, you know, it's a fight for your life. I think that laughter humanizes you. And I tell people all the time, people are laughing. They're less likely to kill you. They may still do it, but they're less likely. <laughs> well, this is, is this part of comedy is not just to make people laugh, but to try to bring people together? By, by using something like that, having people see another point of view. You've talked about this many times in the past that you can bring people together. I, I think that the actual, it's the actual act of laughter. So, so when, you're, when, when people see something they recognize and then they, and they laugh, or you can structure a joke in such a way where you go, oh, I think if we say this, people will recognize it. It's just gonna be awesome because black guys are gonna say it. So that guy, now I'm gonna, now I'm, this is just, I'm doing it right now, this is a stereotype. So if there's a guy who sells propane in Idaho, and he happens to, and he's white, and he happens to like a Key and Peele sketch because it made him laugh, that's the unifying factor, is he goes, <laughs> That's true. What, what, what's funny is he doesn't say this part, but this is what's happening subconsciously. <laughs> oh, that's true. Humans do do that. Humans do that is, what you're, is how you're trying to get them, right? Humans do that. And, and I think it's, it's, uh, it, that's, that's what we try to tap into. It's got to be funny first. 
It has to have some kind of appeal, some human, basic, primal appeal. Then you can slap race on top of it. But the first thing, the undercurrent has to be human. It's got to be funny first. Yeah, like, got to be funny be first. You've got to be careful because, you know, I, when I started doing comedy again, I was doing the Arab Muslim thing, and the fact I was disabled did not register. I'm at comedy clubs, everybody's drunk, I look like I'm straight to them. Right. And so it didn't... Still, it, just as completely still. because yeah, they're like swaying and it makes me, you know, stable. But, <laughs> but I will never allow myself to go out there and be a teachable moment. Like, I'm not here to educate you, I'm here to make you laugh. And I think what you were saying, it's like a gateway drug. Like, I'm their first Muslim and I'm kind of like the lost Kardashian, I make them feel comfortable. <laughs> And they're like, you know. Teach, yeah, a, a teachable moment is death for comedy. You never saw a black comic ever walk on a deaf comedy jam stage. Just, he did, no one ever just came out and just went, white people! <laughs> no one just comes out and just screams white people. <laughs> just, it's the, there has to be some kind of setup and a payoff and a punchline. It just, it has to be that. You know, yeah, if you're hitting, if you're trying to hit a, te a teachable moment, it's gonna be didactic. The idea of, of making somebody laugh and it has to be funny has often been the explanation or the excuse for a comic who does stereotypes in a cruel way without any social conscious behind it. So I just saw Dick Gregory a few months before he passed away. He slayed the crowd and it was really teachable but really funny. Then, of course, we know Pryor, Carlin tried to do it, Lenny Bruce going back. Um, there are, Joan Rivers did so much of it. But the excuse is, if it's funny, that's the only job of a comic. Is that true for the way you approach it? I think, I think that because comedy can be so powerful, I, I personally believe that I have a responsibility. Um, the same way, you know, I, I, I believe, like I believe athletes have a responsibility. When athletes go, I'm not a role model, I'm not a role model. I, no, you are, you are. You really are. I, I, I know you don't want, I know you just want to play. Man, I just want to play ball. I know. <laughs> But you are, though. I mean, and since they're giving you all those scads and scads of money, it, like, what, how is it going to hurt, you know, to, to, to say something? They like, go on TV and they ask you to buy a soda pop when they advertise it, so they are asking you to follow them, so they have to be the role model then. Th exactly. Yeah, 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 or they wouldn't take that money to sell the soda pop. So I feel like, yes, I feel like it's, 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 it's important to do that because it is. That's great, Mason, to say a gateway drug. Yeah. That's a perfect <laughs> way of putting it. It's, 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 the spoon, it's the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, it doesn't matter if you're doesn't matter if you're from Nigeria or Iceland or Spain or or, or Kentucky. You just you you recognize something human, you know. So like responsibility. The country of Kentucky. I made mean, four <laughs> countries and then Kentucky. <laughs> That's because you were educated you know. in the states. <laughs> they don't teach us geography. We own the whole world. Um, <laughs> uh, I had to learn. I had to learn. I was, I literally used every slur in the book. I was a filthy comic. I found nothing funnier than pedophilia jokes and rape jokes and, and just, I was an awful, awful human being. And then I did a TED talk in 2014. They translated it into 47 languages and then people started writing me and saying things like, I was going to kill myself until I saw you. And now I know that as a person with disability, I have potential. And I realized that my words mattered. And I realized that I was smart enough and creative enough to tell jokes that didn't harm my audience. So I didn't self-censor. I didn't say, oh, I'm not going to do pedophilia jokes anymore because I want to make sure I get on this TV show. It was because I really wanted my audience to enjoy themselves, to have fun. I didn't want to invoke pain in people. That being said, I'm super edgy and very offensive. And if you're getting offended, it's because I want you to. <laughs> there are things that are bad in you that need to change. Oh, but can I say really quick? <laughs> You're exercising those things. <laughs> I think something that's also just very fantastic about Maysoon is that it, what, what's really revolutionary is that, is that that's what's important to her. Is like, I'm this kind, you're thinking about your point of view and what kind of comic you are, and then the other stuff's second. It's, the other stuff is just second. It's, it's just do the craft first, and then add the other stuff in, you, if you feel so inclined. You've weaponized a couple of different stereotypes, uh, and they kind of all came together beautifully in the angry Obama 
voice. I told you that was me. That was you. <laughs> Do just like, do brown people just all look alike to you? Is that what this is? Hey, hey. Don't judge me. I'm half African. You're half okay. African. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Undercover brother. That's Let's right. do it. And, and your kind, the Egyptian kind. Right. Uh, we should Whoa. give you a new show, Georgia. That's right. Brownish. Yeah, yeah. Brownish. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just where my dad was born. It's just where he was born. But imagine doing the, like, the president today. Like when you did that angry Obama speech and for him to play along, it was seemed as edgy. Yes. Now what the hell? Well, because we were just, because it was really, I mean, it, it was such an admirable thing for President Obama to do because he was like, yeah, let's just bask. Let's literally bathe in a stereotype of an angry black man and or or the the black man that f seems as if he's sold out because he's holding something back. But we're not holding anger back. That's only one thing we're holding back. We're holding back our hopes and dreams and ideas and love. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody wants to, somebody else wants to weaponize the other side, which is to say, let's do whatever we can to make them not humans, yeah. right? So what we did is showed a multifaceted human by having him be able to say, you know, any words, you know, it, 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 anything at all that just can be the the restraint this man was showing was Herculean, <laughs> you know, to just be like, oh, I guess that's our opinion. <laughs> These motherfuckers is bullshit. You know what I mean? <laughs> And, and trust me, he said, oh, uh, that's what I want to say. You know? <laughs> you know? So you're looking at different facets of a human being. Did cracking up the president bring you uh, more joy than cracking up anybody else? Pro pro pretty much, yeah. It, it, only because, uh, partially because he stepped in it a moment before. He was like, oh, well, come on now. You can't, uh, that's the rehearsal now. You can't be cracking me up. You know, uh, oh, no, no, he said to me, he said, you got to keep it together. <laughs> And then he says his first line, you know, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And then I said, hold on to your lily white butt. <laughs> and then he laughs. And then he goes, oh, oh uh, you got me. No, you <laughs> got me. And then, you know, and then you feel like permission to say, now, sir, you need to not crack up. Red dot on my forehead. You know what I mean? But, uh, but it was, yeah. Do you feel like you um, inspired the current guy to be angry so he didn't need a translator? <laughs> Because there's no inner right. monologue oh, there. No. People keep saying to me all the time. People say to me in interviews all the time. It's like, you know, like, you know you're like talking to someone like a People magazine, like, you know, anything in the future for an angry translator, you get uh, Donald Trump. I'm like, what the hell does Donald Trump need an angry translator for? <laughs> <laughs> Read any tweet at any time during any day. Yeah, yeah. But, it was, but the idea of this guy has shown why you need comics to go on stage and push the boundaries because yeah. it's, Donald Trump isn't a one-off. He represents an enormous segment of the population, and it has become very apparent. Why must you scare me? I'm at Lincoln Center. This is a dream come true. <laughs> Do you have to remind me? Do not take this for her, George. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm here to motivate you. Me. You're only halfway there. There's more work to do. Remember, I'm a Kardashian if they come after us. <laughs> right. Okay? Kanye took care of this for me. <laughs> you. <laughs> the angry black man just hit me, but it's not a stereotype. It's not a stereotype. License and registration, please. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. It just automatically happens. Just automatically happens. Who is... You had mentioned Richard Pryor. Was there a Richard Pryor routine that you that you saw or heard or any other comic where you went, wow, that's I, I'm changing my opinion on an issue or the world. They broke a stereotype. The the best thing the the the, the best thing I remember ever seeing it, I can't remember if it was live on the Sunset Strip. It might have been live on the Sunset Strip, or it might have been Wanted Dead or Alive, one of those albums. It was when he talked about it's when he talked about he said he said, he said, and then, and then, and then I went, I went to Africa, and it was all, you know, he goes, he goes, Willie the Wino was the mayor. When he said, Willie the Wino was the mayor, and it was that amazing thing to think, is he walked off of a plane, and his whole paradigm of existence changed, because every face he saw right. was black. Mm. And that, and I thought, and that might have been the moment in my life. It was him, him doing that, that joke there, and the other one was uh, uh, Whoopi, Whoopi, Whoopi Live on Broadway, when Whoopi Goldberg, um, she said, you know, I traveled around the world and I did this and I da da la 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 in one of her bits. And then the audience looks at it and she goes, what, a junkie can't have a master's degree? <laughs> I thought was great. I, I just never had thought 
that could, oh, that could be something. Oh, that could exist. Even in that Richard Pryor, at the end of that joke, he says, he looked around and he saw all these black men and the one thing he didn't see was, he didn't see any, and then he said That's the N-word. Said, said, I'll say it for you. Yeah, right? he, like, said, I can't. he stood there almost crying. And he said, and he said he, he could feel, you could feel the emotion in the performance. And he said, all I did as I stood there and all I saw was black men. And the one thing I didn't see, I didn't see no niggas. And that's, and I, I remember in my dad's living room, I started crying. So then I'm like, oh, comedy can do that? I'm like, everybody loves Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood with Eddie, Mur Eddie Murphy. He's a gifted, gifted being on this planet. And lots of things he's done have moved me to, to laugh. But often Richard Pryor moved me to cry. And Richard Pryor also completely embraced his disability. And that's what resonated for me. Again, I was watching it way too young. But he, he, he wasn't ashamed. And he, you know, it, it was a torturous journey to get where he was. And he wasn't ashamed. And he talked about it. So that gave me that. But Carol Burnett was a huge influence in my life. Carol Burnett used to always pull her ear as a signal to her grandmother. And I remember watching her and being like, I want to be that person so that I can always communicate with my dad. Because my dad was my hero. He like, he really raised me up. And I was like, someday I'm gonna be like Carol Burnett. I'm gonna pull my ear and my dad's gonna see me and be proud of me. And I don't know why it wasn't doctor, it wasn't lawyer, it wasn't engineer, it was Carol Burnett. Thank yeah. you so much. You're so See you welcome. soon, Keegan Michael Key. Thank you. Thank you.